I said in the worship prep on Wednesday that Jesus did not have to have divine clairvoyance to know that he was on his way to a confrontation and defeat from Pharisees and Sadducees and the political powers with Herod. The signs of opposition were there for a while. It's just fine for a prophet to talk about God and Torah laws, but when they start applying them to social and political realities in the world, instead of personal and spiritual living, it causes unrest and false hopes that lead to uprisings. Jesus was a troublemaker and needed to be put out of their trouble. So we have this miraculous, far-fetched for us modern sophisticates event. Jesus picks three close followers to go up a mountain with him. All three of them had been there from the beginning, and they were core leaders of the little band. James and John were the ones who wanted to be left and right when Jesus came into his kingdom. Peter, just recently at Caesarea Philippi, had declared out loud that Jesus was the Christ, Messiah, then promptly forgot that Jesus told them for the first time straight out, that the Son of Man must suffer many things by the elders and the scribes and the chief priest and be killed and on the third day rise again. So this visit from Moses and Elijah is divine validation for Jesus. God gives Jesus the gift of a rare divine assurance of Jesus' purpose and that his Lord will be with him, whatever the outcome. God gives Jesus more than sufficient grace. Moses went up the mountain to receive ten commandments and faced golden calf worship and rebellion when he got back to the valley. Elijah took on false prophets of Baal in a test of water and wind and fire at an altar, but wound up in a cave by himself, fearing for his life that he was the only faithful one left. Jesus knew all this history of what happens to prophets. God then clouds over them and up close speaks words. Words that Jesus heard at baptism. You're my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Peter always has a habit of speaking when he doesn't know what to say. And he blurts out, hey, let's, let's build three tabernacle tents for Moses and Elijah and, and Messiah And just stay up here on this mountain for a while in all this inspiration. Jesus' reply is that they need to remember what they did to Elijah. This Messiah was a transfigured divine epiphany and a faithful realist. So the lesson for Transfiguration Sunday in today's commentary and application It's pretty clear. Followers are not in it for the results. Faithfulness is not a cost-benefit, profit-loss calculation of strategy that gets us rewarded in heaven. Following doesn't lead to options when someone else is in front of you. God is leading Jesus. Jesus is leading followers. It's nothing less or more than trust and obey. There's no other way. Lent is following, not knowing where faithfulness will take us when we full know full well where it took him. There was something all week that bothered me about Mark's straightforward account of this event. Everything in Mark is sparse and plain, but it's not simple. 
I was missing something. You know that I keep telling you that you have to read Scripture in larger chunks, that that favorite verse or that little passage you love can mean something very different when you read the whole chapter. Context in Scripture is everything to content. So I took my own advice. The lesson today starts with the phrase, six days later. Well, if you don't read what comes before, wouldn't you be curious about the six days before? Why is it that Jesus is so serious and tells the followers not to speak to anyone about what had happened? God speaks to Jesus, you're my beloved son, and then tells the followers, Listen to him. They weren't listening. Peter's awakening that Jesus is the Christ Messiah at Caesarea Philippi comes right before this passage we read. And Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him and got him, tried to get him clear headed about his mission. Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And then, well, we really need to read what Mark says happened after that and before the transfiguration. He he called the crowd together with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world And forfeit their life. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory with his Father and the holy angels. Well, it isn't Lent Lent yet. That starts Wednesday. But you may as well know the reason things are going to become more serious. And Jesus has realistic expectations that it's going to get worse. Now you see why Peter wants to build a tabernacle tent for the law and the prophets and the Messiah and stay on the mountaintop. They see more clearly what Jesus was saying, that the rule of God's love that will transform life does not come without sacrifice and defeat and losing. We are called to be faithful, period. If it means a cross, if it means losing friends, if it means turning your idea of the good life into his idea of a truly good life. If it means spending less on your wants and pleasures and more on others' needs and pains, it's following. If it means more than just praying your kingdom come, but not doing his will on earth so that it looks more like heaven, that is following and not knowing where you are going. But, no, but knowing who is with you, in front of you, every step of the unknown. There's a huge shift in Mark's timeline in the gospel. He goes from all of these examples and proofs of Jesus' power and his authority to the growing awareness that Jesus has that trouble is coming And it means his suffering and death. Jesus tells them to keep quiet because they will only misdirect people 
to the false idea that he has come to restore the glories of Israel of old. Jesus has a completely different kingdom in mind, a place where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. We speak those words so lightly in our weekly prayer. Lent should make us look at what little Jesus tells us to pray for ourselves and how much our prayers are supposed to point us to what we are supposed to be doing for God. This is the time in the Christian year when I always speculate that us realistic Christians decide that Jesus really did not mean those extreme teachings in the extreme that they are heavenly visions and divine hopes that we have to adjust in our more realistic living. In a sense, their divine idealism that's possible for the Messiah, but not really expected of us ordinary followers. Grace means that God loves us when we fall short and we get in no matter what. It's kind of cost-benefit analysis and heavenly reward insurance. Before we get too comfortable with our own compromises, let's take a serious look at a couple of thousand years of why the church has been resilient despite the world's rejection and our own weak commitments. How can we thinking How can we keep thinking it is just pie in the sky and foolish hope to love enemies? To reject eye for an eye and and be good to those who hurt us? To stand up to murder, especially to children? And even more, to reject anger and hate that's the heart of it? How can we think that it's impossible if we've never tried it? What if we really got serious? about championing faithful sacrifice instead of becoming subconscious slaves to commercial idolatry. In this room and out there living in this sinful generation, there are many who have trusted and obeyed, and I'm not obedient enough who have been serious enough to change their lives for the sake of the least who only Jesus loved, they are the reason we are still here. And there is a question in today's application that we cannot avoid for Lent. Are we the ones who make the church fragile? Because we trust that someone else will do the things for God that we will not do. We started this whole journey this fall saying the main thing is to remember that the main thing is the main thing. We get the more than sufficient grace too. What happens when Lent makes us turn our faces toward the main thing and we have to decide whether we're going to sit in our tabernacle or walk where he leads? Amen.